Here's to you, dear listeners, and welcome to Metal Gear Mondays, the most thorough Metal Gear podcast on the internet. I am sometimes your host, Sam Wright, and I'm joined today with by some friends for an interview episode of the podcast that we call Metal Gear Mondays. Gentlemen, starting in alphabetical order, please introduce yourself. Last name or first name? This is hard. I'm going to let you guys figure that out amongst yourselves. I'm Alessio Summerfield. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Isaac. But yeah, so uh, so we are doing another interview episode. This one's a very interesting one. I think this is the first time we've um, we've branched out of um, the voice world as far as our interviews go. We, we talked to Terry Wolf, um, our first interview a couple months ago. and um, Bless you, Terry. Bless Thank you, you, Terry. And then um, now we've gone full circle. We talked to... Is it full circle? I don't know what that means. It's full ten circle. Full ten uh, circle. Yeah. We're talking to Ryan Payton, um, who is just a, a a wonderful dude. Um, it's it's very exciting interview. Alessio, mm-hmm. talk to me about Ryan Payton. Yeah, so Ryan is a l- lovely young man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan uh, Ryan is somebody who has worked on the sort of production side of Metal Gear. And he has credits to his name, uh, such as uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence, uh, Metal Gear Solid uh, Portable Ops, uh, and Metal Gear Solid 4. Um, and he'll get into his exact experiences with all of those in this interview, but it seems like Portable Ops is Portable Ops and 4 are probably the two that he poured the most of himself mm-hmm. in. Um, he's also worked on things like Halo 4, and uh, he is the kind of, uh, I want to say owner. I don't know if he's co-owner, founder. but he's one of the owners. Yeah, yeah, founder and sort of uh, uh, key fella over at um, Camouflage, uh, based out of Seattle, Washington. And they developed such things as uh, Republique and um, now, most recently, the Iron Man VR game for the PlayStation 4. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's and he's, so he's, he's done a lot. You're going to hear a lot of cool stuff in this episode that we had no idea um no idea about yeah, you're hearing our genuine you're hearing our genuine reactions because holy shit i don't think we realized who we were talking yeah to. we got some, right. we got some scoops um so it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of fun um yeah hold on let's walk that back real quick so we're talking to ryan payton the father of the battle royale genre <laughs> uh, the, the the reason why shenmue 3 exists and uh quite a lot of other things mm-hmm. and a huge influence on a lot uh on mgs Four? MGS everything. MGS everything. Everything. Yeah. Also, uh, Three and <laughs> airsoft partner to Fumito Ueda. Yep. So there's that. Yeah. You'll find out. You'll find out and about all that stuff. Personal Airbnb. Airbnb. <laughs> 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 to legendary game developers everywhere. Yep. So we're gonna. It's just a cool interview, guys. Um, yeah, this was awesome. Yeah. So thank you to Ryan for uh, for taking time out to talk to us about. Um, about his history in the industry, about his projects, um, for actually for opening up to us about some difficult stuff too that he's had to deal with um, during his during his career. Um, just for being a generally good dude. Um, also for like fellow podcaster, he yeah. uh, he was like sort of the official English Kojima Productions podcast host. So that's amazing. Indeed. So it's so yeah. So just all kinds of cool stuff. He's such a cool dude. Um, don't know how many times I can say that, but it's true. Um, oh, we need, definitely need to give a massive shout out to Chris Zimmerman Salter yes. for connecting us. Indeed, we do. Um, yeah. So I think she maybe even mentioned it on her interview. So if that airs before this, you'll you'll hear the moment when she talks about Ryan in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the the prequel to this interview. So so yeah. So we will. Um, We'll get into the interview with Ryan here in just a second. Um, you can find Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Payton. That's P A Y T O N. Um, you can also uh, find his company uh, Camouflage on Twitter at C A M O U F L A J. If you want to keep up to date with the stuff that they're doing, um, and yeah, so keep keep. We're gonna talk. We'll we'll, we'll mention that again in the end of the episode, but. Wanted to get that up at the top. Um, 
You can find us on the internet at MetalGearMondays.com, um, where you find links to our YouTube, to our Facebook, to our to our Twitter, all kinds of stuff. Um, social of all kinds. Patreon.com slash MetalGearMondays, where we have lots of fun um, bonus perks starting at just a dollar a month. Um, what else do we have? We've got a YouTube. You know, we, we just got a lot of cool stuff. So check, check us out on the internet. Um Alessia, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at AC Summerfield pretty much everywhere or acsummerfield.com. Um, and like, yeah, PSN, Steam, pretty much wherever. Uh, Battle.net. You, come find me. Come play games with me. Come talk to me. Just reach out. I don't bite. And I try to be responsive. So, yeah. All right. And Isaac, what about you? Hey, guys. I'm just here because like, Isaac exclusively exists when the record button gets hit on this podcast. Yep. Yeah. Otherwise I go to avoid not to be seen. <laughs> oh my god, that's actually horrifying. That's existential <laughs> it, uh, Tell me about it, Alessio. I have to live it. <laughs> yeah, Isaac's existence just completely <laughs> becomes black whenever like we oh, hit no. we we hit stop recording. It's just like zoom. Can we can we keep rolling, please? <laughs> <laughs> please don't let me please don't send me back please to the dark place again yeah. i don't want to go back to the dark place <laughs> it's not really scary actually um <laughs> moving swiftly along you can find me otherwise yeah you can hit me up at doesn't have a twist <laughs> um i forgot, wow. I forgot even <laughs> you even didn't say that yet you forgot, you forgot that he had an actual yeah an actual twitter answer. to go to yeah yeah yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Sanjul. That's S A N J U U L. Um, and yeah, this that's it. We're gonna talk to Ryan Payton. I hope we talk to him again in the future because I he the number of times that he said we'll save that for another episode. Yeah. I just wanted to be like, yeah. cool, let's do that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would like to have Ryan Payton back on repeat episodes. So mm. yes, let's do that. Uh, I guess we'll. Um, Send Isaac back to the void from whence he came. Oh. And uh, we'll go talk to Ryan. <laughs> sorry, Isaac. It Bye, has, Isaac. It has, to be, it has to happen. I'm sorry. Hey. Bye, Isaac. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before I dive into our questions, um, I just wanted to, right off the top, uh, thank Chris Zimmerman Salter for putting us in contact with each other um, and ask you a little bit about just your experience with her. Yeah, Chris Zimmerman Salter uh, is one of the first people I was able to work with uh, on when I joined the Metal Gear team uh, back in 2005, I believe it was. Um, and uh, yeah, so she's a voiceover director, as you know, and uh, I, I think my first project with her was on Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. And uh, so that was you know, 14 years ago. And so we've, we've stayed in close contact ever since, obviously worked with her on other Metal Gear titles, uh, worked with her on Halo 4, uh, worked with her on um, one of our, one of my more recent projects and, uh, and my current project as well. So yeah, uh, great, great friend, um, love her to death. And uh, she's a big part of the, I think the Met- Metal Gear DNA. Right. Yeah. We, uh, we just recently interviewed her. I think by the time this episode airs, that episode will have already aired. Um, and it was just awesome just hearing her talk about her experiences and she was, she was so, so great. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, we just had a really good time talking to her and she's just had such a breadth of experience across Mm -hmm. the entire industry. It's nuts. Yeah. She, uh, she's fun to talk to too. So yeah she's definitely a lot of fun <laughs> i definitely knew she was a voice director when she called me back and asked if we could do some pickups and i was like why not <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. sounds about right That's awesome so um well yeah so outside of that i also want to get this out of the way for anybody who may not know this so you um kind of officially produced a podcast for kojima productions called the kojima productions report um, we're kind of the weird basement stepchild to <laughs> your official work. Um, can you tell us what it's like to just, I don't know, a, a officially produce a podcast for Kojima Productions? What was that like? Yeah, it was a, it was a, a daunting task. And I, I, I think I've got a pretty good story um, that I'll, I'll keep pretty short. But uh, as I mentioned, I joined Kojima Productions back in, in 2005 uh, as an international coordinator. And uh, so I was a pretty low-level guy. Um, working on um, like a lot of coordination between the different uh, branches of Konami and helping with 
trans- translations and things like that. And I remember um, around the time that uh, I joined, it was right around the time that blogging was becoming popular. And I don't know if you remember the Hideo blog. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. What he was doing. And uh, so he was posting these, uh, Hideo was ex- uh, posting extensive blog blog posts uh, around that time in Japanese. And then he came to me and said, hey, I really want these to be um, translated in English. And that's its own other story. But then he kind of got into podcasting. And then um, I remember him telling me like how popular his Japanese podcast was. And um, and uh, he said that uh, it would it'd be great to have an English version, but that's obviously a much trickier thing to do because am I just going to record this podcast per week about all the things that he talked about on the Japanese side? You know, it's kind of two steps removed. And would that be very interesting? And so um, I kind of changed the format on the fly and we just started to just talk about talk about Metal Gear and, and other Kojima Productions related titles as much as we could without revealing any new information. Uh, because like PR did not want me to be like the official mouthpiece for like all new announcements and, and, and things like that for rightfully so. Right. But uh, I think we did a really great job of talking about having an official Metal Gear Solid podcast every week, but by, by, without like really announcing anything. Uh, and uh, one thing I remember and uh, is that, uh, you know, he, he at, like at a certain point, he was kind of like poking at me and like teasing me of the fact that his podcast was more popular than my English podcast. And he said, <laughs> well, the company in Japan only has 300 million uh, citizens, but like the whole English speaking world is many, many, many times that. Why is your podcast so unpopular? And I took that, I took that as a challenge. And, uh, and I, I, I put a lot of effort into that podcast, made it as good as I possibly could. And uh, at one point it was, it, we had uh, over a hundred thousand listeners every week. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, and I remember, <laughs> I remember Hideo stopped asking me about, uh, to kind of up my game, uh, <laughs> because I think we might've surpassed the Japanese side. <laughs> so that was, that was something I was pretty proud of. A podcast to surpass Metal Gear? Yeah. <laughs> How is that possible? So, so they, they said they didn't want that podcast to be the, the source of truth, like for reveals and things like that. How much did you, like, how much did you know? Like what kind of scoops did you have? to potentially reveal oh, i had i had all the scoops oh man i mean i was <laughs> scoop master. had all the scoops i mean i yeah i mean i uh, you know this is kind of a nice way to just kind of introduce myself in a way to your audience but uh i am i am the luckiest person in the whole world um just officially uh and by by what and what i mean by that is that i played metal gear solid the first one back in 1998 as a high school student i thought this is amazing it just blew my mind it opened my mind to what what games the medium of games could do uh and then fast forward seven years later and i'm working on the sequel to the sequel to the sequel of one of my favorite games of all time and i and metal gear solid 3 is my is my favorite video game of all time so i end up working on a sequel to my favorite video game of all time how many people could say that right and uh and not only working on it i was just so involved in so many aspects of kojima productions of metal gear solid 4 portable ops uh, the podcast uh, lunar nights bulk tie uh, the digital graphic novel, so many aspects of development. Uh, I was just right there on the, on, on the ground level. Uh, and it was just, it was a dream come true. That's why. So yes, yeah, I had, I, I had like the, my keys to the, the keys to the castle. I knew everything was going on. I had to be very careful about not announcing um, things accidentally. That's crazy. I feel like you sort of came on board at like the perfect time. Cause it was sort of like the golden era for Kojima development. I feel like mm-hmm. it was just like yeah. the most, uh, efficient kind of like they're just pumping them out. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. And I, I joined very soon after the announcement of Kojima Productions. I believe he announced it at E3 2005. That's where I met him. And that's where he basically on the spot offer, offered me a job. Um, it took me uh, until Tokyo Game Show, which was in September. So it took me roughly about three to four months before I actually joined, joined the company. But you're right. That was right. right like it was a, kind of a golden era of that studio. Because uh, it was a lot of ambition, he wanted to do lots of things, lots of games, lots of merchandise, like expand the world, and just do more than just games. And so it was a really, really exciting time to be working there. Nice. Um, I'll kick it. I'll kick it on over to Sam to ask another question here in a second. But I, I just had to ask, and I'm sure it's like blasphemy that I cannot recall mm-hmm. off the top of my head. But I really enjoyed listening, and I'm going to be totally honest. I'm going to go on record and say this: the podcasts that were included on the iPod in Metal Gear Solid Four <laughs> are a big reason why this podcast exists. Oh wow! And I can't recall offhand were the podcasts that you were producing were those the ones that shipped with the game, or were they were yes. they the IGN ones? Oh, okay, cool. 
Yeah, yeah, we yeah, we produced some. I can't remember how many we did, but bef- yeah, and that, those were burnt on the disc. So, yeah, and those those were fun, like kind of running commentary about the game and lots of interesting insights. Like that, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, they were great. So, um, you are based in Seattle, much like myself, which is not uh, which is not common <laughs> to see. I don't think um, within the industry. <laughs> right. um, have you been out there for? most of your time working in games or was it kind of a semi-recent move? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I yeah, born and raised in Washington state oh, nice. uh, after I graduated from high school, um, went to college here near, near, near Seattle. Uh, and then, um, and then I went to Japan on the, on the, to, to do a job with the jet program, which I'm certain some of your listeners have heard of, which I was basically an English teacher uh, paid for by the Japanese government for a year and a half where um, to the point where, um, I was doing freelance work for OneUp.com, EGM, Wired Magazine, Japan Times, uh, and that's what brought me as a journalist. Brought me to E3 2005. Met Hideo. He offered me a job, and the the rest is history. Um, but I am spending a total of five years in Japan, and then um, after shipping at Metal, Metal Gear Solid Four uh, and do some family things that was going on at the time, I ended up coming back to the Washington State to the Seattle area, and I've been here ever since. So yeah, outside of those five years in Japan, yeah, the whole the Seattle area the entire time. Very cool. Where did you Where did you go to school? I went to school at the University of Puget Sound, kind of a small nice. liberal arts college in Tacoma. Uh, and yeah, now now I live in more of the downtown Seattle Bellevue area, um, where we have our a studio that I started eight years ago called Camouflage. So we're ho- home to about sixty developers no, here. Clear. I can throw I can Seattle throw Bellevue I can throw area. a rock at you right now. <laughs> yeah, you probably. Oh, really? Nice. No, I, li- I, I live in, I live in the uh, Kirkland area, so I'm pretty close. Oh right! Oh yeah, very close. Wow. Yeah, we were all we were all just up there. We went to the uh, Renton City Retro, where we got to meet uh, 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 David and Cam, uh, David Hader and Cam Clark. Oh, that's right. Um, I forgot it was a lot of fun. Great. Yeah, it was cool. my second time ever in that area, and I think it was Isaac's first time. Yeah, and, uh, we had a blast. Day, first time. Oh man, just barely miss each other. That would have been kind of fun to meet in person next time. Mm-hmm. I uh, I wanted to ask super quickly, actually, because I don't I. I'm going to reveal the, uh, I'm going to pull the curtain back just a little bit. Uh, in prepping these questions, I don't think I ever once wrote out uh, anything about like asking uh, about camouflage. Um, Chris talked very, very fondly about you guys in the interview that we did with her. Um, and I know that there's a lot of sort of shared DNA kind of across the uh, across the uh, the aisle, so to speak. Um, could you tell us a little bit about like when Camouflage kind of came to be and uh, sure. your role and all that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So um, after shipping Metal Gear Solid 4 to Microsoft, I was a uh, creative director on Halo 4. I spent three years at Microsoft and uh, was, was more or less pushed out. Um, and uh, that was a, one of the hardest days of my life, um, you know, a lot of people have gone through that, like getting fired, getting demoted. And it was, it was real and it hurt. Um, and I was pretty motivated still at the time to, to do something meaningful in games. And I really do stretch, uh, look back at my time playing that first Metal Gear Solid game about how it really opened my eyes to games and how we could be u- utilizing games in the, as a medium to tell stories in really interesting ways and, uh, and really influence the way people think and hopefully in a positive way. Like it opened my eyes to you know nuclear proliferation and then and, and, and if it's an interesting story about the Cold War in Metal Gear Solid Three, right? And so um, when it was it came time to figure out what I was going to do next, I I sold all my Microsoft stock, which was at the time twenty five dollars a share. If you want to look to see why my dad likes to laugh at me now, you can look go look at what the share price of Microsoft <laughs> was these days. Um, and I liquidated my four hundred one k at a fifty percent top tax uh, penalty. Uh, and I just invested all that money into starting Camouflage, an uh, independent game studio, all about making meaningful games. Um, so yeah, we started in 2011, and uh, we got straight to work. We and just a few people that I met online, and we just started working out of my bedroom and eventually graduated to our own office, a really dingy office in an old condemned bank building. And uh, we pitched a game called Republic on, uh, on Kickstarter. We raised over a, a half a million dollars. And then, yeah, just built a five-part episodic game that's really very much a, uh, inspira- insp- inspired by Metal Gear Solid, but also really inspired by the first few uh, Resident Evil games. And so, yeah, really proud of that game and finally finished that, that game in 2016 after releasing all the episodes. Um, and then we had a different project that um, 
that we were building that got canceled. Uh, and then uh, was through a, a crazy story for another time. Um, I got wrapped up in this current project uh, with Sony First Party Worldwide oh. Studios. Uh, and we're doing an exclusive uh, PlayStation VR game, uh, Marvel's Iron Man VR. And we've been on that game for almost three years now. And uh, yeah, we're just, uh, even today, just working super hard on that game, trying to make it as, as, as great as it could possibly be. That's awesome. Yeah, all of our uh, all of our fans and uh, sort of Patreon supporters, we 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 have a, like a private Discord, and we were all on Discord chatting about the sort of state of play. I think the first video yeah, that yeah. came out, um, and whenever we all saw the Iron Man VR reveal, we were all like, "Oh, holy shit, that looks <laughs> phenomenal!" Like, oh, thank um, you. So we're we, yeah, we're all very excited. So yeah, the, the 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 trailer, you know, does a good job of like communicating that a it's an Iron Man VR game, but. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't get like a lot of fans want to see more of the gameplay so we're really excited for whenever we can show more of the game and talk more about the game but uh yeah i think it's worth getting excited for i think that the team is doing a really really excellent job but also the insomniac guys have set a very high bar for what a playstation marvel exclusive game could look like with their spider-man game so we've got our work cut out for us (laughs) for sure so we were um um kind of interested in this one little tidbit um we giant bomb had mentioned that you got brought in mid-development in mgs3 to help quote-unquote westernize the game feel for the series um how is that accurate or it's it's close it's close so yeah let me let me uh let me set the record straight (laughs) (laughs) uh i joined Kojima Productions, just as they were wrapping up uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence, uh, one of my first jobs was to, to, to play test the game. And I was so excited because, again, as my favorite video game of all time, I was more than happy to jump back into it with that 3D camera uh, and to see all the new content. So that was, and play a lot of Metal Gear Online too with the team. So that was a really fun way to join the, join the company and, and get initiated. So I did not join um, Konami and, and get, it was, and where was, nor was I asked uh, to, to westernize the game at that time, right? Um, but what ended up transpiring, and I hope you guys don't mind me kind of taking a little bit of a detour here to, to get to the, oh, to the answer, but um, my, my career within Konami was, was really, really took off um, thanks to the Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops game. Um, as you guys know, obviously, as, as huge fans of the series and as, you, as the great work that you guys do at the podcast, um, the, there's a, those, that, those two PSP games prior the Metal Gear Acid and Metal Gear Acid 2 games. Um, mm-hmm. Metal Gear Acid 1 in particular did very, very well. But the, the most common feedback we got from, from fans was uh, we want like a more real Metal Gear game, right? A stealth action, a 3D game. Um, and that's what the Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops um, game was. Uh, but the problem with that project was that it was very much a, a, little, a little, little sister, a little brother to the big project, which was Metal Gear Solid 4 at the time. Didn't get a lot of attention. The team size was pretty small. Uh, and uh, the, it had development problems, it had serious development problems. Uh, and so what I did pretty early on in my time at uh, Kojima Productions is that, and I was young and crazy and so excited to be there, is that once I was done with my main job um, around like 7 or 8 o'clock at night, um, I would go and pair up with the audio director of Portable Ops, and we would just load up a build on a PSP dev kit, and we'd just play the game every single night together and, uh, and just like kind of talk about things we liked and didn't like, and we'd wrote up those notes, and I would send those to the team, before I went home at like two or three in the morning. And, um, and apparently I didn't know that at the time, but the team was just looking at those notes and they would just change the game based on the notes I was sending every, um, that they would get in the morning. Uh, oh, and, wow. um, <laughs> part of the reason was uh, for a lot of reasons, but there was some, there was some leadership challenges on the title. Um, and I got busy with like, a, I did was doing a lot of uh, business travel for Metal Gear Solid four. But I remember I came back from something and the, the, the project lead for Portable Ops came to me and said, um, where have you been? Uh, where are your notes? Uh, we've been going for like a week and we, don't, we haven't seen any of your notes recently. I said, oh, I, I was just doing that to help out. He's like, well, don't stop, please. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. So I was I like, nobody ever told me that I was like de facto director and I really wasn't. But I think I did kind of fulfill that role because, again, of like lots of challenges with the project that they were having. Um, and so I just kept doing that, um, all the way to ship. And, um, I remember the game was almost done and almost really great. And, but it wasn't quite there and it wasn't going to hit black Friday in time. And I remember personally going to Konami America and begging them for an extra few weeks 
and they agreed to a delay. So I believe the game came out in early December of 2006. Um, so it did miss Black Friday, but it did come out and it reviewed very well and it sold very well. And uh, I remember the the rap party and I remember, I will never forget this, Hideo came over to me. Um, we're all kind of celebrating the release and how successful it seemed like it was going. And he said, I heard what you did on the project. I was like, "Uh oh, I'm in trouble. Like I figured he was going to tell me I should have spent more time working on MGS4. Um, and he says, I want you to do what you did on that project on Metal Gear Solid 4. Uh, in, in particular, I think you did a really good job of giving like a Western perspective. And I'm worried about, um, you know, some of the critiques that we got on MGS3 about the controls. And, and rightfully so. I think the Metal Gear Solid 3 controls could have been better. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was one of my many jobs. But yeah, I was very much involved in giving feedback and, and, and in design meetings and just talking about ways that we can make sure that the game didn't feel too obtuse to Western audiences. Uh, and obviously, Gears of War was a big uh, was a big influence at the time. Yeah, that makes sense. I wanted to ask, actually. So it's interesting. So Ryan, I, I'm sure you don't know this because we have way too many episodes, and there's Ooh. no way in hell I would ever expect anybody to listen to. <laughs> I've listened to them all, but I've listened to yeah, I've listened to a, a, a fair amount. Oh, that's, thank you. That's kind of you. Um, but um, I wanted to say, so you're the first person that we've talked to who hasn't come in from like the voice side. Oh, interesting. Um, because like even so we had Jeremy Blaustein who yeah. translated the original uh, Metal Gear Solid on um, but even he and my sort of I don't know in my thinking is sort of still tangentially kind of connected to that voice mm. world um, and so to kind of get your perspective from like an actual production boots on the ground um, I'm really curious like what's your perspective on Hideo Kojima because I think we just kind of keep hearing like whispers in the dark, but like you've actually had sort of, I don't know, like development chops with him. So I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. Oh, it's a, it's a, such a broad question. I don't know exactly how to approach it, but um, I'll say, you know, my, my perspective on, on, on Hideo is that um, obviously extremely talented, um, has a, has a great vision. Uh, he's hardworking. And I have just a great amount of respect for for him and and and, the, and his creations. Uh, and I enjoyed working with him. Um, at times it was tough; like we didn't always get along. Um, but I I really I really will forever appreciate um, him bringing me on board and taking a chance on me. And he was quite quite generous with me um, during my time at, at Konami. Um, I will say, like, if there was anything I could say that was like you know where maybe we he, he and I didn't always see eye to eye. It was typically in areas where um, I, I was like maybe trying to instill my will too much into a project, right? Which I think is, for better or for worse, like maybe something I, I shouldn't have done, right? Um, because, you know, I'm this like young, ambitious American guy in this Japanese company. And these, these guys have been around for a long time. But, uh, you know, I, I, um, I definitely want to put my stamp on the game as much as I could and help um, the, t- the team also put their stamp on the game. Um, and so I think there was like, but I think there was like a good tension there too. Um, you know, I think we had a lot of good debates. Um, so yeah, again, I, I look, fa- I look back at my time uh, working with him very fondly, uh, and I'm excited to see what Death Stranding is all about. And, um, and yeah. Yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna be going into overtime working on Death Stranding because I think we're gonna we're gonna try to release those episodes of our podcast like as soon as that's humanly good. possible. Yeah, so absolutely. I think we're we're excited and also Daunted, like, a little nervous. nervous. About, I, I, yeah, I think that's that's completely valid. I mean, I don't think anybody knows what that thing is gonna turn out to be. It's like, and, it's like uh, my, my my joke about it is that they release this like nine minute trailer and I still have no idea what to expect from yeah. it. Yeah, uh, I I um. You know, I, I should be careful about what I like all my speculation because, but I, I seriously don't have any insider information. But I, from the outside, what I perceive ha- is happening is that I think he's very much like um, taking advantage of the fact that they're more independent and uh, can kind of just exercise his, his, his flex his creative um, muscles to the max on this thing. And uh, I think it's going to result in something very, very unique. And I just hope it's like a really fun game to play that we all and that we all really love. You know? For sure. Speaking speaking of hot takes and insights, uh, you recently made the news. Um, I did. Yeah. You, <laughs> you were you were on an, uh, on a panel at E3, and it's interesting because I actually I, I will go ahead and say this. Uh, I just, I didn't in my head I wasn't like oh Ryan's definitely at E3. 
Um, but I definitely considered like, oh, you guys are working on Iron Man. I'm sure you're you're there in some capacity. Um, and then I saw the headline and I was like, oh, Ryan's at E3 talking about Kojima. OK, <laughs> oops. <laughs> um, and so I guess I mean, obviously, the context that I've seen is that you just kind of gave a hot take on your interpretation yeah. of that initial trailer. Um, how, how did it go saying that and then being on the show floor? Did people come up to you at all or? No, I mean, like my Twitter got a little bit warmer than usual. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, it was just a, such a fun <laughs> exchange that I had with, with Jeff and, and Luke Smith uh, about Death Stranding and my, my conspiracy theory about what it's all about, or at least that first trailer. Uh, and like, I, I think you guys probably saw, but you know, I, my whole, my, my hot take was that, you know, I think he I mean, I witnessed this firsthand. I think he's, he puts himself in his games to a certain degree, right? Um, they're kind of autobiographical in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and when I saw that first trailer, I thought, I think, I think I know what this is about. Uh, and I think people like, I think people appreciated that and they were kind of intrigued by that, by that conspiracy theory. And, and I was going to leave it at that because, you know, I'm just a fan now. I don't know anything about that project, uh, that, the, that, that you guys don't already know. Right. So. Uh, right. It's fun to be able to right, talk about right. that. And, you know, it's fun that people are curious about what I think, you know, because it's been a while since I've been there. <laughs> I love it. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask, and, and we we have asked a couple people this, but I'm super curious considering that you've kind of worked on both sides of the of the pond, so to speak, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, so having worked with folks like Kojima and then coming back and working on something like Halo 4, I mean – there's a lot of talk, especially on this podcast out of my mouth, mm. um, about <laughs> sort of uh, auteur theory mm, in games. Sure. Uh, because I come from like a film background, okay. so yeah. obviously it's like film is filled with auteurs. Um, what What is it like to work on something that's so sort of single kind of, I don't know how to describe it, I guess sort of singular vision from this Japanese auteur and then, then to come work on something that's Western and maybe a little less kind of single single person steering the ship to, mm, so to speak yeah yeah it's something i thought about a lot as i made that as i made that transition from working under an auteur in japan um and then joining a a very 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 strange team in a lot of ways which was the halo 4 team and i mean what i, what I mean by strange is that uh, without getting too much into the halo development history uh this was the first time that this team um, was was com- was kind of brought together to make this game. Up until now, up until that point, all of the Halo games were developed by Bungie. So this was the first internal Microsoft team, three four three, uh, that was going to develop a, a new Halo game. And I was one of those early members. And so not only was I uh, confronted with the challenges of the only thing that I know about game development is the auteur approach, and in Japan, but I'm going to now move back to the states and try to direct um, this franchise that's well-established, well-respected with a new team and a a team that even whether they're new or they're old, they're not interested in me being an auteur. And I really (laughs) had to um, adjust the way that I worked and (laughs) and really focus on on different aspects of leadership um, and influence in particular about how to help guide the vision and guide the team towards that vision um, in a way that is much more um, I think Western friendly. That being said, though, I think there is a world, obviously, I mean, as you mentioned with film, but also in, in other games too, where like auteurs still exist and, and they're, and they create great content. Um, I, I, I've never worked with him, but I, I, I'm, I, I can, I'm lucky enough to say that he's a friend like Ken Levine, somebody I really respect. And I, I, I see on the outside, like a lot of auteurs and like with, from him and, and his titles with system shock, Bioshock and whatever he's working on next. And so it's definitely possible, but, um, to me, it's just too much friction, you know, like I think us, mm-hmm. us American guys like want to have way more say. And so, uh, I, I tend to, especially like the way I run camouflage these days too, it's a very collective, um, I, I source a lot of ideas from the team and I try to get them to help, help me with leadership as opposed to, um, just telling them what the vision is basically. There's another, um, uh, video game series that we all really love on this podcast um like the eco shadow of the colossus and last yeah. guardian i guess you could say it's a trilogy of sorts um in, in a way yeah yeah it, we noticed that there's a special thank you from fumi Ueda in the credits um what happened how, how did that happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah um 
it actually connects back to my time on Metal Gear and at Konami. So one of the interesting pastimes, I, I don't know if they still do it or not, but a lot of Konami team members um, were really into sort of like what they would call survival games, which is basically airsoft. And they had all this amazing equipment. And on um, on a on a weekend on a weekend, I think I can't remember if it was a Saturday or Sunday, they would oftentimes go out to to the countryside in Japan and they would just play airsoft all day. Um, and they had some pretty serious gear and they had their fatigues and it was really fun to join that. And um, they would also invite other people from Square, uh, from Square Enix and also from Sony. And on one of those occasions, Fumito Ueda came out, which, by the way, just kind of blew my mind, not because he was there and I was a big fan, obviously, but that like Fumito Ueda is going to play like this military sim, like airsoft like, exercise. With, like, <laughs> it's just so it didn't make any sense to me. Um, but it was really fun and we got, and we had like, we spent the whole day together. Um, and that's where, uh, I was able to befriend, um, Fumito Ueda and, uh, we became, we've been close friends ever since. Uh, and, um, so one, one of the things that, that happened was that after I left Konami and while I was working on, on Metal Gear or sorry, uh, I was working on Halo, uh, this was around the time that there were some, some troubles and, and I'm sure you guys all have heard the rumors about some of the internal struggles on, on the last mm. guardian. Yeah. Um, and I was, um, I was able to help him, um, uh, sign an agent over at UTA, a, guy, a gentleman named Ophir Lupu. And I just got really involved in that kind of process. Um, especially as, after I left, I left Microsoft, um, just being really, really involved in like helping him, um, kind of get through that pro that project, um, helping with some of the Sony negotiations, uh, and, um, and just, just trying to support him in any way possible. So, uh, including like towards the end, um, flying out to Japan for a weekend and playing Last Guardian um, before it was it was all wrapped up and, and giving feedback and, and and emotional support and so yeah we've we've just been really close friends and now I, I I'm lucky to say that I I run I help run the business over it at his as new studio Gen Design um, very familiar with his new game um, and helping him kind of shepherd that as well as, as kind of my nights and weekends project so uh, yeah very close to Fumito Ueda. And uh, and uh, really respect and love him dearly. You are a That's very crazy, crazy <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> yeah, well, Alessio, Alessio um, played uh, laser tag with David Hader and Cam Clark, so I guess that's <laughs> in the similar vein. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a survival game of sorts. I think <laughs> that sounds like fun. Ryan, I wanted to make mention as well. So um, we kind of structure the show in seasons, or at least we did until all these crazy interviews happened. Ooh. And now we're just kind of a documentary show. <laughs> um, we, uh, we eventually are going to come to two very specific seasons that I'm extremely excited about. And one of them is covering all of Kojima's non-Metal Gear games. Yeah. Um, and, and the other season is covering people that have been influenced by Metal Gear. Um, and sort of the sort of top of that pile for us is your game oh, uh, republic okay. and so um it's been on our list for a very long time uh we we still have not played it because we're trying to kind of keep impressions fresh sure. for when we cover it for the show um but i wanted to ask i mean is there anything you can tell us or any thoughts you can give us to kind of carry with us into the the playthrough is i don't i don't know do you, oh, have, any, do you have any uh positive vibes <laughs> to send our <laughs> way <laughs> nice wow uh Republic is such a such a strange game uh, and it's such a wayward path in terms of its development and being episodic. So um, I think if I could just kind of yeah um, uh, pique your interest on on the game is really that we we really released them as kind of five separate experiences these five episodes and uh, we took their time with them and we and we got better over time. So one thing I like to impart is that um, the game gets better. Like I, I'm, I'm proud of episode one, but I think it's probably our weakest. <laughs> Um, and I think you can see that the team's craft get better um, over time. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. Um, and yeah, there's definitely Metal Gear inspirations like throughout. But I tried to mm. hold back on those as much as I could because I didn't want to come across as a copycat. Um, but it had some ideas that I had way back from I was on Metal Gear. Um, but it was also heavily inf inspired by Resident Evil um, as well. So it, mm. this in like in a way, and this this will come across. There's no way this is going to come across well, but I'm going to say it anyway is that it's kind of like I kind of think it might be like my death stranding in a sense that like I was a little bit frustrated during my time on Halo um, and I made an independent studio and I had a lot of ideas and there was a lot of stuff I wanted to do and there was nobody to there to tell me like we couldn't do it and I just did it and it's I think that's what the game is it's like it's just like a lot of creative frustration being released and so not everything links up not everything makes sense 
Um, we go, we get too excited about certain areas in the game and it's a little bit uneven in that sense, but I, I, I'm really proud of the work we did. And I think it really helped create the foundation for what, um, we have now at camouflage where we're again, home to 60 some odd people, um, and working on a big title now. So yeah, I'm again, I'm proud of it, but I think it's a, it's a definitely a, it's a creatively challenging game for sure. Mm. Yeah. Having, having just directed a film that is definitely like creative frustration, <laughs> the movie being released. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah I, I definitely, I definitely understand where you're coming from about kind of releasing all of that. Um, I wanted to ask just as a sure. super quick throwaway. Um, I, I don't think is, is there any way to play it on mobile devices still, or do you oh, just absolutely. recommend the PS4? Version? Yeah. I mean, that's one thing we've been spending so much time on is we just try to put on every single device. Like we'll, put it on a toaster if somebody would let me in fact no <laughs> joke and my team loves the like loves to tease me about this um at red robin uh we took a, we had like a team outing at red <laughs> robin for a farewell party they have those like little <laughs> menus those like digital touch menu things right you know yeah yeah you know yeah. what i'm talking about uh order, belly square yeah. like pour one out yeah. for that red robin that's no longer there nice. we're there and <laughs> you can play like bejeweled on there you can play solitaire you can order you can order a hamburger um <laughs> And I swear to God, like I had, I, I had one of the team members take a picture of like on the back of it, what that thing is called. And I had them reach out to them and said, Hey, does this thing run Android? Cause we could probably get Republic running on it. And I would love nothing <laughs> more to have Republic at, at, Red, at Red Robin. So I'm willing to put Republic on anything. And on that, on that note, so you can play it on PC, Mac, uh, Oculus go Oculus quest very soon. Uh, you can play it on PlayStation four, um, and it's coming out on other platforms too. So yeah, we 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 love Switch. Um, very possibly, very possibly. Okay. I may or may not have a a test build of it uh, on my desk right now <laughs> to just <laughs> even ga- gauge whether or not it would run and 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 play well. So not confirmed by any stretch, but we're we're testing it out. Hey Ryan, you need anybody local to play test anything for you? Or <laughs> uh, ab- absolutely, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I really like truly a really do. No, I, I'm I'm so down. You have no idea. Um, okay, man. Well, come, I, come I, I do want red rob. I do want red rob. Red rob. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, mean. I uh, this is gonna be like a really weird out there thing. Did the did the red robin and Bellevue Square close? It did. Now it's a Verizon store, and I'm crushed. When did that uh, happen? It just just recently, and um, oh, man. but you know, like it's okay because there's I still think there's one in Redmond. So we'll yeah, go there for the, the launch party I, of the Red Rob Leak yes. uh, version. <laughs> there's got to be some sort of like crossover. You have to pick up burgers and stuff like that in the game. Something I don't know. <laughs> so, That's amazing. <awesome. laughs> so you had uh, you had uh, mentioned um, that you were you you obviously drew a little bit of inspiration from Metal Gear, but you didn't want to be a copycat. Um, but one of the cool things that you did draw over was you worked with a several people from the series yeah. you work with david Hayter and jennifer hale and um dwight schultz who you worked with on portable ops um yes um what was it like like how what was the process of getting them involved with the project like and how what did you how did you like working with them on your game as opposed to somebody else's yeah no, yeah it's it, that's a that's a that's a really interesting question so i i loved working on the voice over aspect of the metal gear games that i was involved with love working with chris David, Jennifer, Dwight, Kari Payton, so many people. It is so, so like a lot of close friends to these days, to this day. So um, yeah, I just got really involved in it. I just loved it. So I couldn't imagine a world where in the future I wouldn't be working with them. So it really, uh, maybe from the outside, it seemed like, hey, Ryan's just kind of, you know, opening up his Rolodex and calling in some favors. And I mean, there was a certain degree of that, like, hey, can you help me out here? This is a new game, new franchise. Um, can you take a chance on this? And, and, Thankfully, everybody was really interested in that. But it was really came down to like, I just love these people and I think they're so talented and I, I wanted to work with them again. Uh, and so with, with, with David in particular, um, he voiced a character named uh, Zagger and it's a really fun character in Republic. And one of the things I, I was wanted to be careful about, though, is that, you know, David puts a little bit on a, a, a little bit into his voice, right, to get that snake gravel, right? Um, and so yeah. one of the things I want to be c- careful with, with with David is that we more leaned into his like his real voice. And so it's kind of fun for him to just kind of act and just be David. Um, and he's, you know, he's kind of a, uh, free, free spirit. And, uh, yeah. and, it, it, and his character is very much like that. And we even like modeled his character after, uh, after, uh, after Zager or Zager after David, I should say. So yeah, just super fun work with those guys. And, um, and what, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, anymore, he kind of just sounds like that anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's true every time, right? Uh, and I'll say one thing, last thing, which was um, the reason why we worked with Dwight Schultz, um, who maybe some of your older listeners will remember as Mad Dog Murdoch from A-Team. He was in um, Star Trek, Next Generation. Yeah. Um, but he you know, he played a, a, a fairly small role in Portable Ops as a Python. And mm-hmm. I will never forget just how floored I was with his performance in that game. And I remember thinking, I have to work with this guy on anything in the future. Um, he's that talented. And he ended up doing an incredible job uh, voicing the overseer in Republic. Um, there's a lot of problems with Republic, but one of them is not Dwight and his performance of the overseer. It's, it's, it's something really everybody should, should check out. How different was like the experience of working on something a little bit smaller, more contained versus working on a bigger game? Cause it's, it's an episodic Ooh. game. So what, what, what are kind of like the bigger differences between working on something smaller, more episodic and working on like a monolith, like halo or metal gear? It's hard um, because I picked up all these, all these habits, whether they're good or bad, I don't know, but I was used to working on teams of there are hundreds of people are involved. Right. And so with Republic, I'm all of a sudden, you know, looking around my team and it's 10 people, right? Maybe 15 at max, maybe 30, um, which is still a pretty big team for, for an indie title. Right. Um, but I really struggled with that. Um, I really struggled with not having the resources and the budget, uh, but I had these grand ambitions. So I had to get really, really creative. And so we just did so many things um, to try to keep the, the budget in check um, to try to reuse assets. And, and, and but I, I think I feel a lot more comfortable with a larger team because uh, that's kind of what I was born into. Um, and with, with, with Iron Man, for example, like, you know, we're at 60 some odd people right now. It's not where we were at Halo or Metal Gear Solid 4, but I'm getting a little bit more into my comfort zone because it's a little bit more of a, a larger scope. So yeah, I have to say I really, really did struggle. Um, and if I ever had, ever had to work again on a smaller like indie title, um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I would love it or not. You know, um, I do like those kind of bigger epic games. Um, it's it's interesting that um, I was kind of going through your catalog. It it kind of clicked for me in my head, and obviously like we carry a lot of pieces of previous projects with us <laughs> yes. into current ones and yada, yada, yada. Um, but before Metal Gear Mondays, or I guess actually kind of concurrently with the podcast, I started like a very long video game documenting project. Mm-hmm. And so I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, actually. And um, I happen to meet these three awesome brothers that were making a game. Mm-hmm. And their youngest brother, Sam, was like, dying of an intense blood cancer oh, no. um and they're making a game called Crashlands. i don't know if you're familiar no. with it at all um and i started documenting them because i quite honestly thought sam the youngest brother didn't have a lot of time mm. and so i went down this rabbit hole of documenting these guys for like two years or like a year and some change um ultimately he beat the cancer the game did That's extremely awesome. well um devolver picked up the show oh, cool. whenever we finished it and that was awesome. Um, and then I went on to do some more kind of game development and stuff, like capturing it with film, um, because I never put the time into actually learning how to develop. I was mm-hmm, like, I'll just, mm-hmm. I'll film you guys doing <laughs> it. Um, I wanted to ask, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in just sort of like, and I don't say this in like a talking down way, but like dingy <laughs> Midwestern basement development setups and like just oh, yeah. being there during cr- crunch and stuff like that. I mean, I'm curious to hear, kind of your take on the difficulties of indie coming from where you're coming from. We definitely lived the, the dingy basement life um, early in the early years of camouflage and working on Republic. Uh, and, and we have actually, if anybody's curious uh, on our, on our YouTube channel, uh, we uploaded our entire uh, uh, documentary that we, that we filmed um, about the making of Republic uh, with the, with the permission from our Kickstarter backers. If you check out the first episode, you can see, um, the <laughs> the office that we were working out of at the beginning, at, once we graduated from my bedroom, and it was an old <laughs> condemned, condemned bank building. Uh, and I was paying $481 a month, so it was an absolute steal. Um, but it was disgusting. <laughs> it was disgusting. And we really, I think we really earned our stripes um, working out of there. It was, I think it was a good, at the time I didn't love it, right? I liked having the free sodas at Microsoft. I love the, the, I loved working in, at the time, I think the most expensive plot of land in the entire planet, which is where the Konami building was in Tokyo. Um, so, you know, I kind of, again, kind of born out of like bigger studios um, with big, big budgets and all that. And then to be in this condemned bank building with a, a pretty junior team 
And, and a guy like me who I didn't have lots of hands-on experience, you know, I experienced like with direction and, and design and things like that, but not a programmer by trade. So I had to, I had to learn a lot of things too. And, um, and yeah, it was really tough. Um, and I have a deep respect for those, those folks that, um, do a lot better than I can, which is, I'm um, just scrapping together and, and making great games and building off that budget and making the next big, like you know, the next big game. And, and I don't want more to add other than to say like, it's, it's, it was really hard, but it was also really rewarding. And I, I'm glad that I went through that. So, uh, and you talked about your hard, the hard work and uh, everything and all the blood, sweat and tears, but what does Ryan Payton like to do? for fun it's maybe it's already it's been it's kind of coming out here but i'm obsessed with video games and i'm obsessed with helping <laughs> other developers and talking to other developers uh i love talking to folks like you who have an interest in games and want to help you know have meaningful discussions and, and educate people about the development process right um so like Ryan Payton is very much about video games, like from morning to night. <laughs> so, you know, I wake up at six, I'm working at six 15, um, on camouflage duties for the most part. Um, I get to the office at 10, we have stand up, and then I'm just working, working, working on the game with the team, uh, all the way till about seven or eight, um, go home, have dinner with my wife. And then I either play a game or I get on the phone with developers that I can help out with. So, um, that's not just Fumito Ueda, but I'm also, I'm pretty deep in with uh, Yu Suzuki on Shenmue 3 at the moment. Uh, I'm a partner in a, in, a, in, a, in a project financing fund for games, for indie, indie games called Kowloon Knights. And we provided funding actually towards Fumito's new project, um, and a, uh, Spirit Fair, which was on the stage at Microsoft this uh, past E3 um, from a studio called uh, Thunder Lotus. So we feel like, yeah, funded about 18 titles at the moment. So, yeah, I'm just like, and then that plus a bunch of other stuff. So, I just love games and anything I could be doing that's kind of even tangential to helping developers, making great games, uh, loving games, documenting them. I'm all in and that, that's my hobby and that's my life. And I feel very, very fortunate to have it. Nice. You kind of um, spit it out subtly, but you worked with, um, you're working on Shenmue 3. Um, I am. <laughs> that's kind of like uh, one of the, Another one of my um, um, favorites, if you will, Shenmue Two. That uh, nostalgic to say. So the good, least. right? Yes. Um, so what? What was your? Um, what's your? I guess. How? I don't know. I'm just. I don't know how <laughs> like, to ask like, this. like what the <laughs> hell, right? Yeah. You're just like name dropping all these can games. You, I'm like, can you Whoa. confirm the inclusion of sailors in Shenmue Three? Or uh, oh man, um, I haven't seen a sailor yet. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was wondering if you knew anything about sailors. I was going to ask you guys, um, but uh, <laughs> I hear they hang out by the docks. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah, it's so it's so much fun working on that project. Um, so yeah, I know this is a Metal Gear podcast, so I'll, I'll keep the Shemu chatter to a minimum. But oh, you know, you bring the <laughs> bring as much in here. Right? Hey, you're the boss, you know. So yeah, here we go. Um, <laughs> so I. You know, you guys asked where I went to where I went to university. I was yeah. So in, in near Seattle, I um I, I played. I remember importing the first Shemu game from Japan, and that was a I was studying Japanese at the time, and that was like my gateway in a lot of ways to Japanese culture, to language, and uh you know full voiceovers, and um, I kind of struggled my way through the first Shemu, and then imported Shemu two, and I really credit that game to let me uh, just like it helped me build like a really profound love for. Japan and the culture, but also the language and help me kind of hone my language skills too. So uh, I owe a lot to that series. Uh, and so, um, and I remember being profoundly disappointed and sad for Yu Suzuki when everything kind of became unraveled um, after Shenmue 2. Um, and he just, it was clear that the franchise was not going to continue. And I remember thinking about his legacy and like, what would it be like to be somebody like him? Um, who was like a god, an absolute game development, game creator god, right? Um, only to be just kind of regulated to not making games anymore. And that actually really bothered me. I didn't know him personally, obviously, at the time, but it just kind of stuck with me. So um, I remember uh, reaching out to Mark Cerny. Uh, he and I were having dinner, and we were, uh, he, was a, he's, he knew Yu Suzuki from way back. And I said, hey, would you mind giving me his email address? He said, sure. So I, uh, I reached out to Yu Suzuki and I said, um, <laughs> randomly, 
uh, you don't know who I am, but I think I know how you can make Shenmue 3. And this is back <laughs> in 2013, maybe. And, oh, my God. And uh, he wrote me back and more or less like, who the hell are you? Uh, <laughs> and, and I said, well, uh, I'll explain who I am. If, like, let's get on a call. So uh, we got on a Skype call and I explained to him who I am and why I want to help him out. And I, I tried to explain to him what this thing uh, like called Kickstarter is. And having been a Kickstarter survivor and having um, went through that whole that whole adventure. That's a good way to put it, a Kickstarter survivor. Yeah, I was definitely a Kickstarter <laughs> survivor. That was a whole other story. But, what, you know, we, we got funded on our game like in the last like six hours. So oh my uh, God. It was, that's a whole other podcast. Um, but, yeah, so he was intrigued. And so uh, we met in San Francisco because he was going to be there for GDC. And then um, I ended up taking him to all these different meetings um, and trying to help him raise funds for the game. Um, but what was crazy is that he had to do some meetings in Seattle. So I took him around to a bunch of places, had him on my, on my, um, living room couch, Yu Suzuki. And I was <laughs> I ended up putting on my, on my shoulders, I'm going to, I'm going to educate this guy, about what's been going on in the games industry for the past 15 years. Um, and so I ran him through GTA five. I ran him through destiny. I ran him through, um, uh, a wolf among us, um, walking oh the walking dead God. games from telltale, uh, heavy rain, uh, I just want to show him all the games that were that like he influenced clearly, right? Yeah. Um, and I just never thought in a, a million years I'd be telling you Suzuki what's going on with video games, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think we just developed a really great bond from that point on. So, um, you know, obviously was able to help him get that uh, Kickstarter started, the Sony partnership, and everything. And so. From the moment the development started, uh, he asked me if I'd be willing to help out as kind of as a, on an advisor role. So whenever I'm in Japan, I like to stop by um, WiseNet, his studio in Botanda, and uh, I just check in on the game and just tell him what I think, you know, as a fan. And uh, it's been it's been great. So, um, can what what can you tell us about how it how it's looking right now? Yeah, so it's man, what a crazy project that is. Um, I have the, <laughs> like in the best and worst ways, right? Um, what what I can say, you know, because I always have to be careful, right? Because I'm not an official, right, right, right. Um, you know, developer of the game, and I don't want to get in trouble with Deep Silver or Yu Suzuki himself, right? But I'll, I just want to say that he is putting his heart and soul into that game. He is there all the time, and his team is working super hard. And it's similar to what we did here at Camouflage, right? He just put together a team a lot of people haven't worked together before, and he just by sheer force of will is trying to realize everybody's expectations and dreams of what Shenmue 3 could be, right? And it's had its bumps on the, along the road, right? Um, but, uh, you know, we're, I know that he's doing everything he can to make sure that the game is as good as possible for release. You know, and I, I have builds and I, I give feedback and I say, hey, this could be better, this could be better. Um, and look, what I can say is like the, the game is like people played at E3, so I'm not saying anything new here, is that it's not going to revolutionize games like Shenmue 1 and 2 did, right? It's mm-hmm. definitely more of a spirit it's like a, it's not a spiritual successor it's a it's a legitimate successor but it's definitely in the same vein as the previous games and as a fan like i'm really happy about that right i just want to make sure that it's as polished and as bug free and as and as beautiful as possible but i can say that the dna is definitely there like yu suzuki is totally there it's very present it feels like a shenmue game and to me and as a fan like that that's 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 something i really I, that's what i wanted you know I, I when we came into this interview i did not think that we would be talking to the reason Shenmue 3 exists but <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I just want to no you're fine I just want to say you're a you're a goddamn hero Ryan <laughs> I just want to leave that there well th- thank you I mean I, I I take pride in that fact that I love to help people um and I, I don't do this for money uh, I just do this for love of love of people and love of games uh and I I hope that the game is that Shenmue I hope that you that you love Shenmue 3 I don't I don't I obviously don't know how it's going to turn out at the end um, but there's going to be some same things I would imagine that you don't like about it. And I'm, uh, and I'm sorry, for that, right? but, uh, I hope, I, I hope, uh, I hope I, I just hope that it's a big success for him and the fans love it and he can continue to make more Shenmue games. You know, that's what I hope for. Wait, wasn't that, wasn't the original series supposed to be nine? Is that right? So like this was, that was, oh man. Um, cause clearly you're interested in this topic. We are going down. A, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going to say we are going, here, we are going down. So down. here you go. This is crazy, man. So, this the first GDC we met. I want to say it was GDC 2013, um, or maybe 2014. But we spent a whole day together, 
uh, in the lobby of his, of, his, of his hotel in San Francisco. And he had this, brought all this, all these documents of all these old Shenmue files, all these story documents, the story treatments. And I remember asking him, I said, I thought there's 16 chapters of Shenmue because that's what I feel like was reported. And he was like, no, 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 it's 11. And I think he's still pretty consistent on that these days. Um, but he said publicly that Shenmue 3 is not going to be the end of the, the story, right? And I don't know exactly what what chapters it covers of the whole saga, um, but um, but yeah, I, I, the last time I remember talking to him, I think he said it was eleven chapters. Oof, that's insane. But not eleven games per se, right? Um, right, 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 right. So I believe I believe Shenmue Two covers chapters three, four, and maybe five. So they're so so putting so maybe like five or six games. Then I mean, I know I I know how many games he thinks it's going to take. Um, oh, I should gotcha, say. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, say no, say no but, more, fam. Dang. <laughs> yeah, but all, 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 my thing is like, dude, just focus on three. Just make it as good as you can. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Um, so a little bit earlier, you had mentioned that you had you were working on something that had gotten canceled. Are you able to talk about that at all? Or yeah, I mean, I I've never talked about it publicly. Um, and it's not because I can't. Uh, but it was that was what a traumatic experience that was. Mm. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to. I just no. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, feel free to pull the parachute on me at any time if you sound like this is getting too depressing. But um, oh no, it, not at all. Get really depressed. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, pit, I so while I was finishing Republic, I pitched I pitched a, a publisher on a game. This sounds like this sounds like I'm making this up, which I think <laughs> like most of the stuff I'm saying today probably sounds like I'm making it up. Like, oh yeah, like air, like. Soft like airsoft with Fumito Ueda and <laughs> yeah, Airbnb, Airbnb with Suzuki. Airbnb with Yu Suzuki. So yeah, I'm totally it's like your re- it's like your real life fever dream, <laughs> <laughs> right? Sounds it feels like that way sometimes. And then the yeah the Red Rob Leak Red Rob Leak. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, of course. In a year or two. So, um, but uh, I I swear to God I was on a I was on a train in Japan uh, and I was asked by um, by a a subsidiary of Square Enix to pitch a, uh, a multiplayer game uh, for this prototype streaming service called Shinra. And I, on that train, I thought to myself, I had this kind of idea ruminating in the back of my mind that I really loved that movie Battle Royale. And I, yes. I would, in a, and the Hunger, Hunger Games uh, movies were starting to come out. And um, I was like, there needs to be a Battle Royale. I think I know where this is going and I'm very scared. Yeah, you should be. Um, <laughs> so this is 2004 or 2005. Or sorry, sorry, 2014 or 2015, sorry. Um, this is a long time ago. This is years before PUBG, years before H1Z1. And I pitched them on a what I called like a Battle Royale game. Uh, and uh, we prototyped it. It was cool. Uh, they went through some hard times. They had to drop the project, and I was able to take it to another publisher and continue to work on the game. And um, about uh, right as we were wrapping up pre-production on the game, uh, and Republic was finished, um, I had a very bad meeting with them in Japan where they said, hey, you know, this Battle Royale genre, genre you keep talking about that's going to be big one day, we just don't see it. We don't think it's a real thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And we're sorry, but we're canceling the game. And uh, that was about a year before H1Z1 came out and just went nuclear and then PUBG and then Fortnite and then the rest is history. Uh, so yeah, um, we worked for a long time. I think almost two years on a battle royale game that never saw the light of day. Wow. Have have you have you spoken to them since and then watched them eat their hat? Um, I had a call with them about a year ago about something different, and I said like, "Yeah, remember that thing?" And we kind of all laughed. Um, <laughs> and but that was like, look, it. I'm, I'm happy about that in a lot of ways, right? Because, Mm -hmm. um, I, I was very angry after I was demoted, um, at Microsoft and was more or less pushed out on Halo. Um, after coming out, I was very angry. Um, and I, I held a really nasty grudge against a a number of people. Um, but over time I realized that that was like not doing anybody any good. Uh, and, uh, now thankfully I can, I say that all those people are friends now and we're, we talk and we go out to meals and things like that. And that was a really good learning experience for me. And so um, when we were canned um, and this battle royale game just kind of vanished in like a, in a blink of an eye, really, um, I decided that I wasn't going to hold a grudge against these guys, no matter what happened after the fact. And I was going to move forward. 
Um, and because the, we, I did that, I was able to land this really terrific Iron Man project with Marvel and Sony. And so I think if I would have dwelled on that cancellation, I would have fought back against it. I don't even know if camouflage would still be around because I'd be so distracted. You know, I'd be thinking about suing people. I'd be thinking about, you know, all these negative things that are not going to really result in anything positive. So um, that's why I can, I can, I can laugh about it. You know, that we were working on a battle royale game years and years before it ever took off. Mm -hmm. Market, the market's market's a little bit saturated, but would you ever consider reworking it and going back to that at any time? You know, what's funny is that, you know, we talk about the creative process, you know, I kind of, I, I put, I put, I took, I put the, team through hell and back on this so we started the game as a battle royale game but over time i started and this is way before again these other battle royale games so i didn't know what worked and what didn't but i started to pinpoint like fixate on areas of the battle royale genre, genre that i didn't like um and so we kept changing it and changing and changing it so it's kind of an evolved battle royale game i'm not going to say it's better but it's not apex and it's not fortnite and it's not PUBG and it's not a blackout it's uh it's different um, the way that the way that went kind of wound up uh, wound up at the end right before it was canceled is it's 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 pretty different. So I think it could survive in the marketplace these days. I just don't know, and I don't even know if the team would be willing to go back to it. Um, mm. You know what I mean? Like kind of like a, you kind have of that's like, kind you of have that experience, and it kind of hurts. We had that experience, you know, um, yeah. and we just love working on what we're working on now too. So absolutely, yeah. I- I appreciate you uh, uh, just kind of giving us that little tidbit about uh, kind of, I guess, the importance of kind of moving forward, even if bad things happen, because I think, uh, I, I, I mean, I've encountered tons of people and even myself have been this person where sometimes the sort of uh, intense emotion kind of blinds you from thinking rationally. So I think it's a really good tidbit to kind of carry forward. Well, thanks. I mean, I feel, I feel like you, uh, you could probably point to probably what, over a dozen Metal Gear bosses that have need to learn that that need to learn that life lesson. <laughs> um, so well, yes, I think one of them is literally named the, the Fury. I was going to say, yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, some, somebody made a joke Twitter account called the Fury, and they often interact with us, and it's always very funny. okay. No, no, I need to follow after this. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Um, Ryan, before we continue, because I know that we do have kind of some lingering questions, I I would just want to be respectful of your time. Oh, I'm, I'm so fine. I, could, I just want to do this. Okay. This is fun. I appreciate you guys hearing my story. Listen <laughs> to my story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, kind of going shifting gears back into sure. sort of uh, post uh, Konami Kojima. Um, obviously, I guess it was 2015 when the brakes were kind of pumped at Konami mm. with in regards to Metal Gear and kind of everything. It's the day the earth stood still <laughs> for our <laughs> listeners. Right. Um, all these reports started coming out about how like draconian and crazy it was to work at Konami. Can you speak to any of that without breaking any rules? Mm, yeah, it's it's tricky, and not because it's it was so draconian that I can't talk about it. It's like, or it's really more about I want to be I want to be careful. I want to be respectful, and um, right, right, right. But I will say, like, there was a there was a few things when I joined that company that I thought, wow, that's kind of strange. Um, but it was never to the point where I thought it was. Um, really getting in the way of what we needed to do on the project. Um, and again, like I, I left in 2008 um, and Metal Gear Solid 5, as you know, shipped in 2015. So um, things could have changed at, within Konami and probably did after I left. Um, and maybe it, it got more draconian or maybe it didn't. I, I really don't know. Uh, but there was a few things, you know, just, but now it's actually weirdly more commonplace these days, but like in terms of like how they track your, you're in and out with your badge, you know. I remember not like liking that, but I know that, that actually is pretty commonplace even here in, in the West. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple other instances Thanks. like examples I could give you, but which I'd rather not get into. But it's not like, oh my god, right. I can't believe that. You know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, kind of as like a quick aside, um, and I hopefully I do not mispronounce this. Sean Eiston, yeah, yeah. Eiston, yeah, Eiston. Um, um, I'm not sure if yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, Absolutely. but Chris also mentioned him to us, and I know that he also produced the KP Alert. Um, so I was curious, like how you know each other and maybe if you can give us any interesting facts to carry into that yeah. discussion with him in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. No, um, Sean's a great guy. Uh, he's, it's funny. Uh, he, he used to work with my boss at Kojima Productions, uh, Ken Imaizumi. I'm sure you're familiar with him. I know you guys talk about mm-hmm. him or you guys talk about him before on the podcast. Um, Ken, I think was able to convince Sean to, to join, to rejoin Konami because they had worked together before, before Metal Gear. Um, and Sean um, moved from Hawaii uh, back to Japan, and uh, 
and, and join the Metal Gear Solid 4 project. So he and I work side by side. Um, so I've, uh, I really love working with Sean and uh, I feel bad too because he ended up, I don't know if he wanted to or not, but he ended up taking on a lot of my responsibilities after I left. So I, I owe him big time uh, for that. Um, but I'm sure he's going to have some really good stories and uh, yeah, just, just a really, really great guy. So you obviously work Metal Gear Solid 4 was obviously this very huge, huge project. We've heard stories from some people that like, like even the voice acting, if you scale it up from one to four was, was tenfold what it was before. What's a, what's a typical day working on Metal Gear Solid 4 look like from, from like your perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for one, I got to preface this by, I touched so many aspects of that game. Um, so I'm really unique in that in that space. Like I was kind of just I was given a lot of freedom, which I really appreciate, right? So my day my day to day is a little bit different, maybe than like a, a software engineer on the game. Mm, that's, but that's uh, I'll tell you, what, yeah. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Basically, you know, I got to the office about seven thirty. Uh, had a lot of email, emails waiting for me from Konami Europe and Konami America. Uh, Try to tackle those. I think we had teams stand up at ten o'clock in the morning, and everybody would stand up from their cubicles. And you got 150 people, and uh, they would all listen to like the team leads, um, kind of just tell people, you know, that here's like kind of like what's going on that day, like a typical s- scrum stand up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then everybody's got to work, uh, and um, it was it's pretty quiet in the office, I have to say. A lot of people have headphones on, and they're just it's it's just it's busy. But what you don't have, which I think I, I observed. I observed this a lot more like on Halo or even here at Camouflage or other studios is that a lot more kind of loud discussion. I didn't observe that as much on, on, on at Konami and uh, you know, they had like their internal wikis and things like that where they were handling a lot of stuff. But, and as you know, it's a very much, much more of a top down development. So you kind of have your specs and you know what you kind of have to build. Um, and so everybody had PS4 or PS3 dev kits, um, which got really hot over time. <laughs> um, I remember, uh, you know, during development where we had over a hundred PlayStation three dev kits, just spewing out heat. Like Jeez, we didn't have to turn the AC man. on. It was, it was like a sauna in there. I remember um, my one but, PlayStation was bad. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine a hundred, 150 <laughs> of those women. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, a lot of guys would work late. I work late. Um, and, but I like, like in a lot of studios, that's oftentimes where the magic happens because you're kind of done with the meetings throughout the day. And guys are just playing the game, and we walk over. We we'll, we'll, we would play Metal Gear Solid online together, um, just kind of testing things out, try a boss or something like that. Um, and that's where like a lot of those fun spon- spon- spontane- spontaneous discussions would happen. And we would go out to dinner because we were in downtown Tokyo in Roppongi uh, with lots of great food options. So I just have really really fond memories of being with my my team members, working on the game, just being really passionate about it. And everybody was just so they, I think they love what they do, you know. It was really great. What was your favorite moment? I know it's like a lot of moments, but if you could pick one out, what what was a, a like a big one that sticks out working on Metal Gear? That moment where Hideo told me that I I need to get really involved in MGS Four was was a, a defining moment, and he actually said that in front of the team later, uh, in front of the whole team. So that was like really interesting experience, right? To be told like, Hey, this is this guy, Ryan, you've probably seen him around. He's going to get more involved in the development now. And, uh, that was a big moment for me. I don't know if it was my favorite moment, but it was, uh, it was something I will never forget. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that, look, this happens on most game developments, but the game is not fun. 95% of development time. Right. Um, and you're worried and you're nervous. And it's like, is this thing going to come together? <laughs> and <laughs> I remember, I remember distinctly, uh, as you guys know, Metal Gear Solid four came out in June of 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember going back for, for Christmas, uh, right before like, you know, six months before that. Right. So December, 2007. And I remember coming back from holiday and loading up the build and seeing that, wow, there's like enemies are still not moving. There's bosses that are not moving. I'm falling. I'm clipping through the world. I can't actually get from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. And it's January and the game's coming out in June. Jeez. And we're going to, you know, cert this game in around April. Right. So how is this going to become a video game in like three and a half months? And Nobody, I mean, people were worried, but they weren't panicking. Like I was feeling that sense of panic <laughs> and um, because it was really one of my first rodeos. And uh, 
it was a, it was, um, I just remember that feeling and I remember just the excitement I had as the game was coming together and that nervousness that, wow, I, are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? And it kind of all culminated in something that um, you guys may or may not have heard about, which was that kind of notorious uh, Metal Gear Solid 4 boot camp. Do you guys uh, know about oh, this? Yeah. Uh, I, I think I heard about it, but I don't know I've, anything I've about it. Be... So basically what it was, we'll, was, we'll it, was like a, it was a it was a preview event of Metal Gear Solid 4 where we invited journalists from around the world to come to this <laughs> crazy Konami like resort um, in the middle of nowhere um, where you could we teams, the Konami teams could rent out for like team retreats and it's really nice. And we, we, so we invited a bunch of uh, journalists to come and play uh, a, a more or less beta version of Metal Gear Solid four. And um, we also sourced a lot of their feedback after they played the game. And um, it kind of culminated there. Cause like the game was coming in hot. Right. And, but the, everybody was there playing the game for a whole two or three days and everybody seemed really into it. And I just remember feeling just like this profound sense of relief mm. um, that the game is going to be good and the game is going to be all right. Um, and, I'm, yeah, it's, and I'm, I'm not to blame for like some sort of crazy disaster or something. So yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite moment of the, of the project, just knowing that it's, everything was going to be okay. That's always a nice feeling. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice feeling, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> the sheer relief. You're right. So, so when did you leave Konami? So I, my last day was somewhere around probably July or August of 2008. So, you know, three or four months after Metal Gear Solid 4 shipped. Okay. So, so you're living in this world, they, Metal Gear Solid 4 comes out and it's this huge, like, conclusion to everything. Like it was the conclusion to three, one, two, all of these games. Yeah. yeah all of them. What w- were you surprised when they announced Peace Walker and that more was coming? No, I was not surprised. And not because I already knew about it. I didn't know about it. Um, but I'll tell you why is that um, I knew having worked so intensely on the story and, and on that Metal Gear Solid 4 database, which I know you guys talked about. Oh my God. I love show. that thing. <laughs> so I worked a lot on that thing, by the way. Um, and I could tell that there were still stories to be told, right? So I thought, like, if they were going to do something, they were going to kind of fill in the blanks um, after MGS4. So I always thought that at some point Hideo was going to want to tell more of the big boss story and kind of fill in those big gaps, right? Mm. So I wasn't surprised when I saw Peace Walker. And I also wasn't surprised because when I, around the time I left, uh, Hideo was starting to talk about doing like a Portable Ops 2. Um, and he, but he wanted to do something that was a little more cooperative and that was something that was going to be bigger. And really kind of capitalize on the success of PSP in Japan in particular, um, in, in large part because of the massive success of the Monster Hunter um, portable franchise in, on PSP in Japan. And a lot of people in the team were playing lots of Monster Hunter um, during development of MGS4, me included. So, um, oh, that is, that is definitely evident. Peace Walker. Yeah, absolutely. Peace Walker. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, literally, like Monster Hunter is in the game, uh, like a monster. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, for all those reasons, I wasn't super surprised when I saw that. Um, and I'm assuming that you're also wondering if I was surprised if that they made another mainline Metal Gear game after four. Mm-hmm. I kind of assume that that's where, the, where this is headed. But, um, and I have to say that I was, I was surprised um, because I, you know, Hideo has done this a number of times where you'll say, this is like the last Metal Gear <laughs> game. And then he, and I think he generally means it, but then he kind of, he starts getting excited about the possibilities again. So, yeah. So I was I was kind of surprised that I thought that he really really was ready for something. Do you have any Do you have any general thoughts on five? I do. <laughs> uh, I think it's the I think it's the by far the best playing, most fun Metal Gear game of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's incredible. Uh, I think that the story, however, uh, leaves a lot to be desired, and and as a massive fan of that franchise. I really wish it just kind of came together a little bit more. Uh, and yeah, it was just a little. Yeah, I just think the story was just like, just could have could have been better. Preaching to the choir, brother. <laughs> uh, real quick, Ryan. Um, I wanted to say I'm not sure if anything changed on your end, but you sound like you're across the room from. Oh, sorry, mind. sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh no, no, you're totally fine. Um, and we and we are definitely coming up on sort of our last questions. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, nice. Well, um, 
I, I, <laughs> I think we, we, I feel like we ask this question to a few people and usually the answer is like, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I wanted, I wanted to get your thoughts. Um, if a wish master approached and was like, Hey, I can, I'll grant you a wish. Uh, would you wish we paint this theme really quick? I am the wish. Master. <laughs> <laughs> would you, uh, would you want a metal gear solid six, um, or like a, an original metal gear remake that follows the events of five. So what I, this is what I want is that I want, if there's gonna be a new metal gear Solid game that Hideo has to direct it. Um, because I think that metal gear mm-hmm. is Hideo Kojima. Kojima is metal gear. Well, we saw what happened when Survive right, came out. Right, exactly. Um, and look, and look, <laughs> look, Shinta Nojiri did a great job directing Metal Gear Acid. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other been people that like have like done their own takes on Metal Gear, but to me, it just it would it, there's just no way it doesn't come across as disingenuous. I think um, if you don't have Hideo involved in some capacity, so that's there's that. But what I really, really want more than anything is for some team, maybe even the the current Konami Metal Gear team, to take and finish five right and to make like a subsistence version of it i think it there's it's mm. so good but it, it but it's also has so much so many areas where it could be improved upon and uh seeing that last you know boss battle against liquid would be just like properly done would be amazing i really want that game guys help like let's let's like yes. let's somehow tell yeah. the world that this needs to happen and somehow just like <laughs> for what it's worth i don't know if we really need it sounds, I don't mean this in like a negative way, but like, I don't know if we like Hideo needs to direct that necessarily. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like the blueprints right. there for sure. Well, I mean, there are like, I mean, yeah, there are details that got scrapped from five that exist for people to see. Right. So I, exactly. I, yeah, I feel, yeah, I feel like surely there's something. Those would be, we had, so we had substance, subsistence, maybe we call it sus- sustenance. sustenance. <laughs> <laughs> your solid five sustenance. Oh, sign me up. Pre-order now. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful um i think for all intents and purposes that is all we had prepared and obviously we did end up going a little over on time sam isaac do you guys have any additional questions for ryan this is going to be like a really like dumb random question from a reference that you made earlier is mark cerny as pleasant of a person as he seems like he is yeah mark's great um obviously super smart (laughs) super smart right um and so it's kind of it's kind of hard to have dinner with him because he's so brilliant you know (laughs) like you just feel inferior um but yeah, yeah, he's he's awesome, man. He's great. Yeah, because I remember I remember the first time I'd ever heard of him was when the PS4 got announced and he was talking yeah. about all the specs and everything like that. And I was just like, I could listen to this man talk about anything <laughs> forever. Yeah, and you know he's got a Metal Gear connection too. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, you know, he he would like advise, right? You'd see him on in credits of games and things like that. And mm-hmm. I remember him uh, giving us advice on on how to make Metal, Metal Gear Solid Four better, especially from a technical perspective. Um. So yeah, there's like a there's a kind of fun crossover there with Mark Cerny and, and the Metal Gear franchise as well. Hmm. So we got to sign him up. We got to find him. <laughs> got to get him. Get him. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, Ryan, where can people find you on the internet if they want more of you? Uh, you don't want more of me, um, but uh, <laughs> if, but if you want to yell at me or like blame me for the Metal Gear Solid Four story, uh, which some people <laughs> like to do, I didn't write. Let's just clear the air here, guys. I know we're go- over over on time. No, I didn't going. write the story of Metal Gear Solid Four: Guns of the Patriots. Listeners, <laughs> please, like, look, I love, I love, like, I love your passion, but like, I don't need you to tweet at me, like, like, fuck you for Metal Gear Solid Four story or whatever. Like, that's like not helpful um, because you got it all wrong <laughs> yeah. anyway. I didn't, I didn't write the story, but um, like, and I know so that, you're not responsible what, for Meryl and Johnny getting married. I'm not. I'm not. Look, uh, I'm proud of the work we did, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't. I didn't write the story. Um, but if you do want to, Ryan, would you would you be pro or uh, would you be pro or anti uh, Solid Snake actually shooting himself at the end of four? Uh, you know, at the time, I was probably more pro. It sounded like David similarly because he said he recently. I think he was just just very very recently on an interview where he talked about how he was actually having a debate in the voice booth. <laughs> about how snake wouldn't miss if that's what he was mm-hmm. going to do. Yes. Yeah. We, we, we had some great debates with David in the, in the, in the booth on during I'm just for recording. Um, that's a whole other show we should do. Um, <laughs> but I remember at the time thinking that it should happen because, um, it's like, like it will guarantee that it's, it's over. Like, just like commit, like stick the landing, man. Like just commit. It's over, you know? Like, don't, don't check it out, basically, is the way I was thinking at the time. 
But now as I get older, I'm like, you know what? I think it, it was kind of a, I think it was the right move. It was more merciful and I think shows more respect to the character. We'll continue with where people can find you. I'm sorry. sorry I'm, so I'm, like, I'm at, I'm at, at Ryan Payton. And uh, if you want to reach out to me and um, you know, say hi or ask me a question, like I'll, I'll do my best, but um, yeah, I don't tweet too often. Um, and then, yeah, you'll see me doing more, probably more promotion and, and thanks for uh, Marvel's Iron Man VR. Um, that's going to be coming exclusively to PlayStation VR. So super, super excited for that. And um, yeah, just also you can just find me listening to uh, Metal Gear Mondays and uh, helping out get more more guests guests for your show. And uh, really appreciate the the hard work you guys um, put into this. Um, and then you have you a, obviously don't do uh, this for the the big checks that you get uh, right. from all the advertising. <laughs> so that passion I think really comes through, and I I think I, I can speak for your listeners too that everybody really appreciates that. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and then also camouflage is on Twitter as well, right? It's um, at C A M O U F L A J. Correct. Yeah, camouflage spelled pretty weird. Um, we're hooked <laughs> on phonics over here, so A E I O U or vowels, and sometimes that's one. Amazing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you can find us at Red Robin. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> not at Bellevue Square at Redmond. <laughs> but not at Bellevue Square. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. Well, you guys are eating Red Robin in the parking lot of the Verizon. So yes, it's, it's sad. Like. sad. In protest. <laughs> <laughs> um ryan um we as you know uh we kind of conclude the show with the it's just a box tagline um and obviously we we stumble our very silly asses to that finish line uh at the end of most shows but typically we like to throw it to guests to try and uh carry that that torch would you uh be interested in stumbling your way to that line delivery for us so you want me to say the like you remind me of <laughs> Yeah, it's just a box, um, and feel free to get to that line however you please. It's just a box. Just a box.